so we are so glad to have um, uh, Dr. Stephen Lai from Palo Alto Medical Foundation. He's at the Palo Alto office. And uh, Margaret Stevens, she's a licensed clinical social worker. And they're sp speaking today about palliative care in general. What does it mean? And specifically for Parkinson's disease. So take it away, Dr. Lai. And I'll just uh, forward your slides as, as uh, you let me know. Great. Thanks, Robin. Can I, do you hear me OK? I hear you perfectly. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today on a Friday. Somehow I, I have a lot of feet on my, on my maybe, I'll, maybe I'll turn down my volume. Hang on a moment. Um, um, as, Robin as Robin said, I'm a palliative medicine physician in Palo Alto and uh, uh, help to uh, found the outpatient home-based palliative care program at PAMP about 10 years ago. And um, it's been a pleasure to work with Margaret Stevens, who is our social worker. Um, and so for today, um, let's, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, trying. Here we go. So by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that you'll be able to ask yourself, ask yourself three important questions, questions to help plan, to help plan for future medical decisions. Medical decisions. Um, um, understand, understand advanced care planning, planning specifically for Parkinson's, for Parkinson's what, to what to expect at the end of life. End of life. Understand palliative, understand palliative care versus, care versus hospice, hospice and our PAM, and our PAM palliative, palliative care service, care service and how to, and how to complete an advanced, advanced health directive, directive, directive in pulse form. Still hearing, Still hearing a lot of feedback on my end. end. Yeah, we're well, getting feedback there too. I, I see you twice on my screen. Are uh, you? How about, uh, how about next slide? I just turned, okay. off, just turned off my, my volume. My volume. Yeah, my machine is just very slow, I think. Robin, are you able, Robin, to, are you able to advance? Or? I'm trying to. I don't know if you can hear. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. So Parkinson's, so Parkinson's and, and end of life end care, of life care um, and, mortality. Um, and mortality, I think often we spend a lot of time and energy on the initial diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, and today I wanna to talk more about what to expect with progressive illness, how to prepare for this journey, including at the end of life. Um, Parkinson's does contribute to mortality 70% of the time. And there are certain signs and symptoms um, that studies have shown that predict a terminal phase of the disease. Many times patients of ours ask, you know, what are common causes at the end of life? And often it's around infection, sepsis, uh, which is a serious infection, respiratory failure, uh, wasting syndrome where you lose weight and become weaker, and uh, trouble with swallowing and aspiration and choking. Um, one study looked at predictors of mortality in Parkinson's at six to 12 months, and it's often the same signs and symptoms, weight loss, um, or they've been on Parkinson meds for a while, but they're having more side effects um, from the medications. So I think in Parkinson's, what we see in our practice is a common pathway of weight loss dysphagia, which is trouble swallowing of liquids and aspiration um, and recurrent infections, loss of function, you know, and mobility where they need more assistance. Those are the signs and symptoms when hospice support would be most appropriate. Uh, next slide. And I think we need to do better to support 
patients with Parkinson's at the end of life, um, there's significant underutilization of palliative care and hospice. I mean, this statistic is, is very surprising. Less than 5% of Parkinson's patients use hospice. Um, majority of patients with Parkinson's die in the hospital. Uh, one study showed that 97% of Parkinson's patients who died in the hospital lacked a documented goals of care conversation or advanced directive. And what we'll be talking a lot of, about today is what is advanced care planning? Because patients who complete advanced care planning, go through this process, are much more likely to die at home. Um, next part, next slide. So what is advanced care planning? Um, it's a process where you make, making decisions for the healthcare you would want if you become unable to speak uh, for yourself. Um, and these are your decisions to make regardless of what you choose for your care. Um, and I'm going to focus on this part. The decisions are based on your personal values, preferences, and discussions with your loved ones. Uh, next slide. I think one of the important things to start out with is choosing a DPOA, which is a durable power of attorney, uh, a surrogate decision maker, a healthcare proxy. Um, again, this is often family, spouse, sons, daughters, family members. Um, but I think a good decision maker, and, and you can click on this uh, slide one more time. I think it knows they are your durable power of attorney, it is available and easy to reach. They understand your values. They known you, they've had these conversations, and you trust them to make decisions on your behalf. And so I think for today, these are three important questions that I hope you can, if you haven't already, I think they're important for you to think about and be able to communicate that with your decision maker um, and to your doctors. Um, so number one, what brings me joy? What makes life worth living? Number two, what would be important to me if I became seriously ill or near the end of my life? And finally, what quality of life would be unacceptable for me? For me, in my daily practice, I'm often asking these questions to my patients early on in the disease course and trying not to wait until there's a crisis in the hospital uh, to make some urgent medical decision. I think these are things that we can do in advance and, and they're very helpful for doctors to understand <clears throat> what's important to you. Uh, next slide. Um, I stole this slide from my friend and colleague, Dr. Rami Sala, who also is a palliative care physician um, at PAMF. And um, I chose this nice picture of a tree to highlight how these questions, those three questions can be the guide your healthcare, for your healthcare decision in the future. And um, I wanna uh, show the next slide here. Mm, sorry. Yeah, so you can oh, imagine, <laughs> um, we can go back, you can imagine that your health status can change this conversation. I think we would all have different priorities if the doctors thought we had five days to live, five months to live, or five years to live. Now, as you can see on this picture, um, at the branches, we have medical decisions. I've listed many decisions that come up near the end of life. And you know that trees don't grow from roots to branches, but this is the approach we take in medicine. 
we get a diagnosis and lay out a menu of options for a patient and their family to decide as if they were picking what they'd like for dinner from a restaurant. But by doing so, we put the disease front and center and bypass the person who actually has the disease. So at the trunk of this tree is the person, their goals, their values, and priorities. And we, when we have that information, those decisions at the branches become a lot less overwhelming. So I'll just give a couple examples. I'll use myself. I'm thankfully a relatively healthy middle-aged man with no serious health conditions. I know that what makes life worth living for me is my mental awareness, my ability to think on my own, interact with family and friends, and my faith is important to me. Um, so knowing that information, I would go through any aggressive treatment if my doctors thought I could maintain those abilities. Now let's say that I'm in my 70s with more advanced Parkinson's disease. Um, and also my cognitive mental awareness has begun to decline. Um, and I'm needing a wheelchair to walk around the house, but I'm not really able to walk around the block anymore. And I've been in the hospital a couple of times in the past year for pneumonia and a fall. Um, so I know that aggressive interventions like CPR run a much higher risk of leaving me in a state where my cognition can be worse than it is now and, and likely in, with more disability. And therefore, I may not want that to be done. But we are all different. For others, their goals may be to be as pain-free as possible, not to be a burden on family, to work for as long, I mean, to be at home or to not live in a nursing home. Um, and for others, some may want to live for as long as possible, no matter what state their body is in. So as, as you can tell, these are highly personal decisions. And when things get confusing, there are specialists like myself who can help guide the conversation and ask the right questions to get at the heart of the issue. And that's where palliative care can come in. Uh, next slide. So what is palliative care? This is um, our national organization's um, uh, definition. You can click one more time. You know, we care for patients living with a serious illness. Our focus is to improve quality of life, reduce suffering for both the patient and family. And, you know, based on the needs of the patient, um, it, it can be appropriate at any age, at any point in a serious illness and can be delivered alongside curative treatment. Uh, next slide. Um, at PAMF, um, we need a referral from your primary doctor or specialist for palliative care. And as you can see, we have five locations um, throughout uh, the Bay Area, and we do a variety of visits, whether it's in the home, clinic, or video visits. Um, I think a common question that comes up is, what is the difference between palliative care and hospice? And uh, Margaret, if you would like to speak to that, that'd be great. Let me see if we can unmute Margaret now. I think she was on mute. Uh, let's see, Margaret. I did not see Margaret. Did Margaret, uh, hmm, did Denise, do we have any idea if Margaret called back in? I only see one wireless caller listed as guest at the top of the attendees. Okay, well, well let's guess um, that's her. Margaret, <laughs> is that you? Uh, it doesn't sound like it. Okay, well, I that's okay, as, as we're figuring it out. 
Um, palliative care, um, I've touched on already on the previous slide. And I think hospice, when I think of palliative care, I think it's a big umbrella term and hospice is one piece of palliative care at the end of life. Um, hospice, again, also focuses on quality of life. They focus on comfort and symptom management during that terminal phase, which Medicare defines when life expectancy is likely six months or less. Um, so with Parkinson's, I think I mentioned on my initial slide, some of the common signs and symptoms that would qualify for a hospice admission. And hospice is not a place typically, they come to you as a, as a, as a team of nurses, doctors, social workers, um, aides, um, just a, a t chaplains, a team approach to, to help support you and your family at home. Um, so uh, palliative care can give guidance for patients and families when hospice would be most appropriate and helpful. Uh, next slide. Can I ask if you guys can hear me? This is Margaret. Yeah, we can I'm hear now going to move to the pulse form, which many of you okay. have probably heard about. Dr. Lai. Pulse stands for Physician Orders About Life-Sustaining Treatment. Um, this came to California, I think, in 2008. Dr. And Lai, it's meant to complement the Advanced mm -hmm. Healthcare Directive, not replace it. So it's a physician order recognized throughout our medical system that's supposed to follow you wherever you are. It's a portable document, um, transfers with you. And in California, it's a, a bright pink color and there's one form for the whole state. Uh, next slide. Um, so why did why why do we have the pulse? As you know, um, advanced healthcare directors are primarily to define who the medical decision maker is if you're not able to make decisions, and also give some general direction about what what's important to you at the end of life. However, we know that this is often a uh, a wordy document and and um, I think the pulse was designed so that it could be um, easily actionable uh, document that could guide specific treatment wishes such as CPR. So um, next slide. Uh, next slide. Oh, you cannot hear me? Uh, uh, we can hear you, but you can't hear us. Can you hear us? Yeah, I had to turn Yeah, I think I everything think, off because of the echo. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us? Yeah, I hope I Margaret hope I'm is doing Margaret okay is, with the echo. Yeah, I think it's okay. And Margaret is on the line. Margaret, I am okay. here. Okay. Margaret, go ahead. Okay. Keep, going. keep going. Okay. Yeah, no. Nope. All right. I'll try to get rid of my my annotation. Uh, yeah. So Pulse goes over a range of medical decisions, treatments, um, from artificial nutrition to mechanical ventilator, to CPR. Um, and it's something where you should have a discussion with a physician to complete. Um, next slide. Who needs a pulse? It's for anyone with a chronic progressive illness. 
serious health condition, medically frail. Um, so we do highly recommend it for, for our patients. And it's something that can be updated over time. How you're doing today may be different from a couple years later, and it can be easily updated with a new form when, when you feel like you want to make changes. And I think I've pointed out uh, where Pulse fits in in the continuum of advanced care planning, where we recommend all adults to have an advanced directive and a Pulse is targeted more for patients with chronic progressive conditions. Uh, Margaret, why don't you uh, take this one? <laughs> sure, thank you so much. And again, I'm so sorry for all the technical difficulties. Um, but yeah, so the, so advanced healthcare directive versus the PULSE, um, just to kind of compare uh, each one and what they stand for. A lot of the information has already been mentioned by Dr. Lai, but an advanced healthcare directive is a legal document. It's something that can be notarized or witnessed um, if notary is not available. A PULSE form, that hot pink form, is a medical order. And so as you're working with your medical team, your treatment team at different uh, you know, stages of the disease process, sometimes those wishes in the medical order or some you know, decision-making factors change um, really what the person, the individual uh, wants uh, if they're ever hospitalized, for example. Um, so with an NBS healthcare directive, the individual completes it. Uh, in the post form, the healthcare professional signs off on it and completes it with the patient, with the individual. And that becomes a part of their medical records, um, of course. And so, you know, that can trans translate into the hospital system as well. Uh, for an advanced healthcare directive, all of the adults who are able to make their own decision should, should make one, should have one. Again, this provides guidance uh, for who the durable power of attorney, who the medical decision maker would be for them if they are not able to make those decisions um, for themselves. And then for the post form, who should complete the form? Well, people who are considered high risk for life-threatening clinical events uh, because they have a serious life-limiting medical condition. And so an advanced healthcare directive, it appoints the surrogate who is their decision maker. And on the advanced healthcare directive, um, a person may select that the durable power can act as their decision maker right away, even while they do have capacity to make their own decisions or until they're no longer able to. And that's when the surrogate becomes effective. Um, and the post form does not necessarily appoint a surrogate, although um, as you read through that hot pink form, you'll see that um, whoever it, the decision maker is, we can also list that person as well as any other additional contacts that may be appropriate to list. So for example, in the advanced healthcare directive, if there's a primary decision maker, and then there's an alternate, like a son or daughter or whoever, um, that person can be added onto that post form. And so what we find is that the advanced healthcare directive and the post form, they really do complement each other. They all serve different purposes. They all have different functions, but they do complement each other. One appointing who the decision maker is and then what the wishes, what the medical interventions are that the individual wants or does not want. And so again, Advanced Healthcare Directive appoints or communicates general wishes, choice not to prolong life, choice to prolong life, um, and the Pulse form com communicates very specific medical orders, such as CPR um, or do not attempt resuscitation um, at the time of an emergency, a cardiac event, for an example. Margaret, this is Robin. I just had a question here. I, I'm surprised that the Pulse does not appoint a surrogate. I thought that there was a box at the bottom 
where a surrogate could be a you know a healthcare decision maker if you're unconscious could be appointed. Yes, it can be. So, for example, you know, so we do go back to that advanced healthcare directive form um, to to double check, um, make sure the guidance is, is accurate on all the medical forms that there is that appointed decision maker. Sometimes people don't have an advanced healthcare directive. There, there's definitely those moments. Um, and then there's a medical crisis that arises. And so in that case, you know, would a spouse or a, a, a child, an adult child, um, or whoever is the closest to the patient, can they sign off on a post form um, kind of with consensus that this is their next of kin or their, their uh, legal decision maker? Um, it can be done, it, for, especially for dementia patients, for example. Um, who are not able to make those decisions for themselves about, you know, what interventions they would or would not want that would be reflected on the post. Um, oftentimes that, that decision maker will, will step in and be listed on it. And on the post, um, so it does ask the question of, you know, is there an advanced health care on file? Has the provider, the, the medical provider signing the form, have they seen that advanced healthcare directive? And then it, we can specify, yes, we did see it, it's here, and we're reflecting um, that surrogate decision maker, whoever it is, onto that post form. And they can sign um, on behalf of that patient. Okay, thank you. Sure. You want the next slide? So I think that brings that is, us to the yeah. end yep. yeah, <laughs> of the yeah, perfect. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> there were a few questions so far. Um, Dr. Lai, do you, um, maybe you want to read aloud the question you answered on the chat? And, and then everybody. Sure. If somebody asks, must a patient be at home to qualify for a palliative care referral? Can PAMP support patients who are at boarding care homes? Yes, and we're able to see patients wherever they are located, including boarding care homes, um, as long as they fit our criteria with a serious life-limiting illness. And I stated that we usually assist with symptom management and help with advanced care planning or provide psychosocial support. And would um, everyone with Parkinson's has a life limiting illness? Repeat that again for me. Would you say that everyone with Parkinson's has a life limiting illness? I mean, I think that's a general term. We know that Parkinson's um, is a chronic progressive neurological illness. And so we usually get referrals when Parkinson's is moderate to severe. And we get involved at that point. OK. Um, let me see. We had another question, which was, um, maybe this is a good question for Margaret or, or, or Dr. Lai, either one. Um, should everyone on this call have an advanced healthcare directive? And who on this call should have a post? Yeah, great question. Um, I, we, I think generally speaking, and I won't speak for Dr. Lai, but we definitely encourage everyone to have an advanced healthcare directive. Um, and, you know, the rule of thumb is, is yes, yes, you should. Um, the need for a pulse um, comes for, for those individuals who have um, who have the likelihood that some medical crisis um, based on their stage of the disease process, that there may be some critical events that may happen. Um, so someone with congestive heart failure, um, 
or, um, you know, in Parkinson's is included in this as well, um, looking at just the, the CPR versus a DNR question, you know, would that person in an event where a cardiac arrest, your heart stops, it, it stops beating, um, would that person want to be resuscitated or not, given that there, there are next steps? Um, you know, once um, those interventions, those aggressive medical interventions are performed, there are future, you know, future needs and consequences as a result. So whether that means a hospitalization in the ICU, for example, um, and even more complicated with um, mechanical interventions, a ventilator support to help someone breathe. Um, so for people who are more at high risk for those events to occur, um, that's who typically we we would want to talk about the, getting um, a pulse form completed if they don't already have one. Um, and I don't know if Dr. Lai would like to add anything to that, but yeah, um, so advanced healthcare directive for, for everyone and uh, a pulse form for those where we anticipate that future medical crises will occur um, okay. and medical interventions would need to be performed. Okay, Dr. Lai, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I'm, I'm busy responding to a lot of the questions online. Okay, all right, sounds yeah. good. And, and somebody asked, I see, uh, asked if uh, PAMP services are available down in San Jose, and you indicated yes, that the uh, PAMP palliative care team based in Sunnyvale covers most of San Jose. And somebody's just asked if PAMP extends to San Francisco. And Dr. Lai, what's the reply there? Right now, um, there is a program out of um, CPMC um, in San Francisco. But right now, they're outpatient clinic, only these cancer patients. So. We do not have a program like ours up there yet. Okay. And do you know if UCSF offers a program, palliative care program in San Francisco? I yes. Would imagine they, would. Uh -huh. they do have a home-based program and also a clinic. I think it depends on which hospital system you're in at UCSF. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lai, I, uh, we had a question here about why do you, I think it was your first slide perhaps that said um, that only 5% of people with Parkinson's disease are ever receiving hospice care. Why do you think that that is and is that similar? Certainly cancer diagnoses are in another category. It seems that palliative care and hospice care is more thought of at least for, um, for cancer patients. Is that 5% number is that a similar number as it would be for, say, Alzheimer's disease or other diseases? Uh, there's a lot in there that you just asked. Sorry. Um, I think <laughs> Why do you think only 5%? Several, several factors. Sorry, I'm just dealing with feedback, so it's hard to think sometimes. Uh, I think Parkinson's you're often being seen by neurologists in primary care. And again, palliative care is not often referred early enough. And I think there's often lack of awareness of some of these common signs and symptoms of end-stage Parkinson's where hospice could be most appropriate. And again, we're not having enough upstream goals of care conversations, advanced care planning with our patients. so. If you don't have those conversations with these, with Parkinson's patients early on, they're going to go on the natural common pathway for more aggressive care in the hospital when they get sick. And often then hospice is not utilized in those scenarios. Um, so I think it's a combination of advanced care planning not happening and maybe doctors not um, thinking about Parkinson's as a terminal illness like they do uh, for cancer. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, one of our participants wondered if maybe the percentage was so small because those with Parkinson's disease have a fairly long decline trajectory, long in the sense of can be decades long, and that it may be difficult to determine when the right point there is to refer. Do you think that may play a role? Yeah, I think you said it correctly. I think that's what I was trying to say earlier. Oh, that okay. I think you have a very prolonged trajectory and gradual decline in function, often with sudden declines with hospitalizations. And I think most people don't think about hospice um, un un until it's too late. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that, um, uh, that I wanted to ask about, and it looks like one of the other questions I wanted to ask about too was, uh, you mentioned, Dr. Lai, at the beginning, the three important questions, and um, and it seems that those questions have, uh, at least one of the questions was about, somewhat about goals of care, maybe that second question, which was, what's important in a serious illness. Do you think it's important to have those goals of care or those three questions, um, it, constant conversation about the, not constant, but regular conversation about those three questions? You know, I, I think it's important to start early and, and I think get, get a sense how much folks want to talk about the future, what to expect. Um, I think if you approach it about what's important to them, if they get sick, I think it's less scary. I, I, think, I think the whole idea of talking about it while they're feeling well uh, is, is the approach we often take rather than waiting for a crisis. So I, I do think things can change over time. So these conversations often don't happen in one sitting and they, they do happen over time. And, and I think it's, it's, it's good to revisit, especially if there's a change in condition. You know, maybe, maybe after a couple hospitalizations, um, that's a good time to kind of talk about how they're feeling about everything. Right. Okay, um, this is a good question for Margaret, perhaps. Uh, 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 an attendee asks, what ways can palliative care help families and caregivers? Oh, yes, that is an excellent question. Um, so as a social worker on the palliative care team, a, a lot of the conversations that we have um, is about caregiving. You know, a lot of times we get, I get asked, when's the right time to bring in a caregiver? Um, whether to help maybe families feeling very burnt out, you know, the, 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 uh, the day-to-day -day for that loved one um, presents with a lot of, you know, challenges and tasks that are beyond what a family caregiver can, can take or can handle. Uh, we practice a lot of self-care and we encourage that for everyone as well. Um, so we, we kind of revisit those conversations every so often, especially if we're seeing that the needs are, for care are, are increasing. And so um, we, we refer a lot of the family caregivers. Um, we give them resources. So that's one of the main functions that I, I do on the palliative care team is kind of connecting people with support groups, um, much like this um, in the community, um, you know, um, just other opportunities for self-care um, and, and really navigating kind of the span of the disease process and uh, uh, providing a lot of the, the emotional and the mental health support um, that's very needed to be able to be a family caregiver of, of someone who has Parkinson's or any other um, underlying conditions. And so we, we do have a lot of conversations about caregiving, outside caregiving, how that works, 
um, how that could be a benefit to the family caregiver uh, to offset some of those duties, and also what other options are available for long-term care, including you know boarding care or assisted living, or memory care placements, things like that. So these are kind of ever-evolving conversations and discussions that we have with the families um, and everyone that's involved in the patient's care. I hope that answered it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Margaret. Uh, Dr. Lai, this uh, uh, might be a good question for you. Um, an attendee asks, once a patient has determined that their quality of life for any number of reasons, uh, that their quality of life perhaps is poor, can they opt to bring an end to their life? So maybe you could speak briefly about the Death with Dignity Act that we have uh, that option that we have here in California and what uh, your role would be uh, or PAMF palliative care role might be with that. Robin, can you, Robin, can you repeat the first part of that? Um, yeah, basically uh, somebody wants to know if a person can opt to end their life. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to the Death with Dignity Option Act we have uh, here in California and and what PAMP's role might be with that. Okay. Yeah, uh, the End of Life Option Act in California has been in effect since 2016 and Sutter PAMP supports patients' wishes um, and has uh, designed a workflow around this process, largely based on the Oregon and Washington experience. Um, I think mainly when we assess patients for this, they have to clearly have decision-making capacity. You know, this is, this is their decision and it's not, unfortunately, as you know, cognitive issues um, are fairly common in Parkinson's patients. So um, some of the patients that we see in park, with Parkinson's don't have that capacity. Um, and then I think number two, um, the prognosis has to be likely six months or less. So that's similar to the Medicare hospice criteria. And, you know, that's, that's often not, it's not a fine science, but I've talked already at length about the common clinical signs that um, uh, determine whether someone likely has more months to live than years. So um, I mean, if they fulfill those two criteria um, and they're not having a mental illness like severe depression or something that's affecting their decision-making capacity, then, um, you know, they can, they can initiate the process with the doctors at PAM. Uh, we often work closely with hospices because I think, you know, at that point, we really want... Um, you know, the best level of support at home for these patients. Right. And home being anywhere they're living. Yeah. 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 Okay, Margaret, there, there's some questions here um, that uh, you could address. Uh, some people are bringing up other techniques for having end of life conversations. For example, the go wish cards and the five wishes document. Uh, could you address generally some of these other tools that are available? Uh, yes, those are definitely um, a few of the ones that we've used um, with our patients. Um, you know, uh, sometimes kind of real, you know, real life scenarios, um, you know, just from knowing the person, um, what their interests, what their hobbies, what their likes are, um, kind of being able to use that as the base or having those conversations if you're seeing or if a family member is seeing um, that what's happening at the current time is, is different than from those baseline interests and, and hobbies and things that 
the patient and the, the individual values. So anytime it kind of defers from there. As far as guidance and um, documents and things that could be used to have those conversations, um, you know, there, there are a lot of um, resources for videos um, to have kind of a start to those conversations that we utilize within PAMF. Um, and we typically, you know, can send it to a family member. There's a lot of things internally that has been kind of compiled um, to, to initiate that. But there's a lot of videos. Um, I, don't, I didn't prepare them for this particular um, uh, session, but uh, if you just Google, you know, advanced care planning uh, videos, um, I, I forgot there were certain, um, certain names for these videos uh, that you can just kind of download and, and play and that will help provide some guidance. Um, and there's some very specific ones for those with dementia. I, I know we're not necessarily talking about dementia specific, but at every phase of the disease process, there's some important kind of food for thought conversations um, that people have utilized in the past. I had a family bring it to our, our session the other day um, where the, there's a certain um, evaluation kind of at every, every change in condition that could be considered and that could be a guide to help have that conversation. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the specific documents at hand, uh, but I can always look, look them up and forward them to Robin. Yeah, that would be, that would be great. And uh, Denise is posting some of the, the um, items in the chat and we'll share whatever Margaret you're able to send to us, we'll share with everybody um, on the call. Um, Margaret, somebody wondered if you have to have a primary care physician at PAMP to be a patient in the palliative care program. Uh, you don't, you don't have to have a primary care at PAMP, um, but in order for a referral to us to be sent, there could be another PAMP provider, whether it's a dermatologist or, you know, uh, a urologist, it, it, it doesn't matter um, necessarily, uh, as long as there's some connection to PAMP. Okay, um, very good. So, so any PAMF MD would, or PAMF connection is fine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, somebody asks, um, I'll, I'll read the question. My mother has PD and is in a skilled nursing facility. She has many of the end of life symptoms you mentioned in the earlier slide. The skilled nursing facility is recommending talking to hospice to be evaluated for additional care at the skilled nursing facility. Seems like a good idea to have her evaluated by hospice, but there is no indication she has less than three months to live. She does need more help than the staff can provide at times. What are your thoughts? I mean, I would say, um, you know, having an evaluation from hospice or what we call an informational meeting um, may not be a bad idea just to kind of gauge their sense of what's happening, but maybe it's not um, a hospice, you know, a, a, a hospice referral. Maybe it is more about the type of care uh, and maybe there needs to be um, a discussion with how to provide uh, the care that the, the, the individual needs. Um, so there are different facilities who offer different levels of care. Um, skilled nursing, you know, it, 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 it really depends on the need, I guess I would preface. Um, if it's more one-on-one -on -one attention and more personal care and kind of more timely interventions, then, you know, maybe a different facility like a boarding care would be appropriate if, if someone's more dependent on care. Um, or if it's an, an assisted living or a skilled nursing, maybe a one-on-one -on -one caregiver would be important in that situation. But it, it really depends on, um, is it just the, the level of needs or is this a decline, a true decline where uh, a hospice would be appropriate? And, and hospice would be technically a diagnosis of six months or less. I think you mentioned three so is it expected or is it possible for that, for that patient to decline within a six month period of time um, in their end of life, uh, for their end of life? Okay. 
And uh, to every attendee, I see that Denise has posted a link to our, our program's webpage on advanced care planning. You can find it in the chat. And uh, we also have the, Denise has also posted a link to our program's webpage on um, uh, managing late stage Parkinson's disease and another webpage on palliative care and hospice care. So we have a bunch of web pages out there with a lot of helpful information and um, definitely check it out. And if anybody has more questions, go ahead and send them on the chat or in the question and answer box. Um, let's see. Uh, one, um, Margaret, one person's asking about um, uh, the chance of survival with CPR. This of course has to do with advanced care planning and, and in particular the Pulse document. Could you address CPR survival rates? Um, I could, generally speaking. I don't know if Dr. Lai is still on. I, I know he has a, a hard time. Yeah, he, he had to leave. He had to leave. So it's oh, okay. just, just you. <laughs> just you and us chickens. It is just me. Okay, okay. I'll do my best uh, to answer it. So, uh, and I guess what's important to consider um, as far as um, success rates or chance of survival, first, how we explain it is that, and there's data on this, so I don't want to <laughs> make anything up, um, but for someone who is relatively, you know, young and healthy, um, you know, maybe earlier um, age range, um, 40s, 50s, with no major comorbidities or underlying medical conditions, the success rate is um, about uh, what I recall at the latest is uh, about uh, 10 to 15 percent. Um, and it could be it could be higher. So resuscitation on its own is a very um, complicated process that has many different steps, not just um, the resuscitation, but we're, we're talking about intubation, we're talking about chest compressions, shocks to the heart. These are all a part of the CPR process. Um, for someone who has multiple medical conditions, underlying medical conditions, um, and is more frail, um, older adult, uh, typically, the chances of survival um, and survival, meaning, you know, the ability to restart the heart, we're not talking about the quality of life that comes with CPR attempts and, and revival, um, is, is actually cl close to 0%. Um, and I say close because there are some situations where it, it does work um, and we get that success. Um, but this is why we, we try to gauge and have these conversations because the likelihood, unlike what we see in medical shows like ER or Grey's Anatomy, it, it doesn't actually happen um, in that way where someone get, you see them getting CPR, someone's pounding on their chest, and then they're back to life and back to their normal activities. Um, it, it, in real life, it's not quite like that. So the survival rate for multiple comorbidities, someone who's not necessarily healthy um, and also older in age with frailty, um, it, it is um, a very uh, limited, um, very small chance of survival. Okay, great. And somebody's ask, asking the question, uh, they are just wanting to confirm that palliative care and hospice care are different to the extent that hospice care, um, it's required that the end of life could be within six months, but palliative care does not have that requirement. Is that right, Margaret? That, that's correct. Yes, we, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and our and curative uh, treatment is still possible in palliative care, right? 
Absolutely. Yes. We, we have patients who are actively seeking um, treatment for their disease process. Um, we see can- cancer patients who um, are on chemo and radiation and are still pursuing um, treatment. Um, and, you know, hospitalizations and uh, aggressive interventions are absolutely um, still appropriate for palliative care. Um, a lot of what we do, and I guess a way to think about it is for, for palliative care, we deal with a lot of the life, uh, the symptoms that come with these life-limiting uh, medical conditions. So whether it's pain, um, a heavy emphasis of what we do is on pain management. Uh, Dr. Lai is a, is, a, is a pro at that, and so are, are many of our team members. Um, so any symptoms that come up for that individual, um, with that disease process, so it, it could be it could be anything, but pain is usually one of the the factors, the symptoms that we we help with. Okay, um, let's see. Are there any more questions, folks? Um, uh, yes, the webinar is being recorded, and we will post it to our web page. And I'm sorry, I'm not clever enough to know how to be in Zoom and share my screen and get the web page. But uh, the our web page, our group web page is in the email invitation to this particular webinar. Um, I think it's something like med.stanford.edu/parkinson/northern-california/slash Palo hyphen alto. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, goodness. Um, but anyway, we'll send it out on the email and um, all the recordings of our of our last uh, several webinars that we've been holding since March are there. We had one on driving and uh, one on home care and one on geriatric care management. And, and now this one on uh, palliative care. Um, Let's see, Margaret, somebody asks if you've had a lot of uh, Parkinson's disease uh, patients in the palliative care program at PAMF. Yes, absolutely. At, at all different stages um, of, of Parkinson's. And together with some dementia um, symptoms, uh, so some, some cognitive uh, impairments kind of in later stages. Um, but absolutely, Parkinson's is definitely one of our main um, diagnoses that we work. Okay, with. okay, great. And we have a question. A couple more questions have come in. One is, can somebody be on palliative care and hospice care at the same time? Oh, that's a great question. Um, based on Medicare guidelines, um, you cannot be on palliative and hospice. Um, hospice has a, a very defined point of start. And um, there are situations, and I, I have to say this, there are situations where a patient gets um, transitioned onto hospice because they meet the guidelines and they meet the criteria. And then they do actually really well on hospice where they stabilize and well meaning stabilization. Their symptoms are under control. Um, they're living past the kind of the six month time frame guideline. And what happens is a hospice nurse reassesses and evaluates um, the criteria for patients to continue on hospice service. And when they no longer meet that criteria for hospice, um, hospice discharges and they, the term graduation from hospice, they graduate from hospice, they no longer need that service they can come back to our service and we will continue to follow. So even when someone is on hospice care, if you know it was a patient of ours on palliative for many years, for example, we stay involved, but we kind of are more in the background. Um, Dr. Lai and our other physicians on the team, you know, they stay in touch with the hospice team. So they are in tune with what's happening for the patient but we're not doing active visits and we're not actively seeing patients who are on hospice service, but we're definitely there kind of in the, in the background. Okay, great. And uh, someone asks, 
Can you collaborate or do you collaborate with neurologists? Do you have case conferences? Um, we definitely collaborate with um, neurology um, and any other specialty service. I wouldn't necessarily say that we have care conferences, but if we need to get on the phone with a neurologist and we're in touch and we definitely coordinate care. So if there's a medication question um, or we need to run something by the neurologist because we're thinking, oh, this particular medication may really be useful and helpful for whatever's going on, we will definitely collaborate with the providers involved. We, we don't ever replace any medical providers that are already existing on the individual's care team. Um, so yes, absolutely, we interchange, we, we have conversations and interact on a regular basis with all, all providers, definitely including neurology. Okay, and uh, I know that PAMF, uh, PAMF does not offer hospice services, as I recall, you offer palliative care services. Do you have a list of hospice agencies that you recommend or refer to? To people to, or do you not um, have such a list? Yeah, good question. Um, so PAMF is a part of Sutter Health, and there is the Sutter Care at Home Hospice. So Sutter Hospice is, is affiliated with us, with, with Sutter Health. Um, under Medicare guidelines, we have to provide choices for hospice agencies, and we always present those choices to families. Um, and there are a handful of hospice agencies like Mission or Pathways that we do refer patients to just because they're geographically located for the individuals that we serve in the community. Um, but yes, we have our own individual palliative care resource list, and there are a few hospice agencies listed on that. Um, okay. But typically, Sutter Hospice, Mission Hospice, and Pathways um, are some of those options. Yeah, and those are the one, the three that we we tend to refer people to as well. So I'm I'm glad our lists are the same. Uh, we've got a couple more. Um, let's see. Um, somebody asks um, pain management and Parkinson's disease under palliative care. Is it appropriate to make use of heavier painkillers similar to cancer? Oosh, okay, that's a that's a heavy medical question. <laughs> I don't I don't want since I'm not a, a medical provider, um, I don't want to give the right guidance the wrong guidance. Um, but it, you know, it's um, it's specific to what is going on for the individual, and so there are some. Um, kind of lighter pain medications, I guess you can say, that are less, um, that, that will have less side effects. It, it's really individualized, so it's hard to say exactly. One thing with pain medication, we have to consider the effects and all the side effects that pain medications can cause. It could be confusion, it could be, um, you know, um, um, even constipation as a symptom. So we really have to to balance the pain regimen. It, it really depends. We could start with low doses and kind of see what happens. It just all depends on the type of pain, where the pain is, and the side effects that may occur with those pain medications and the pros and cons of having it. If it's a quality of life measure for sure, um, then we'll definitely recommend um, you know, uh, introducing a new pain medication. Um, and it, we follow that very closely. Um, but it's hard for me to answer that question, uh, just not, not being a medical provider myself, um, but generally speaking um, that yes, it is, is, is appropriate, but we have to pay attention to it very carefully. Okay, great. And uh, one other question came in. This was, a, I thought, a good one as well. They're, they're all really good. Um, somebody asked, does palliative care um, staff or palliative care doctors supplant the primary care physician? 
I'm sorry, I think I missed that word. Do do we replace? Do you? Yeah, replace. The person asks if you supplant or replace. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, no, we do not replace primary care. We work um, in tangent with primary care or any other medical providers um, related, you know, on the treatment treatment team for that individual. So we do not replace. And and uh, uh, palliative care is uh, uh, reimbursed by Medicare, right? It's a it's a standard, uh, just, just like yes. palliative care physician. You're you're instead, or in addition, seeing your your palliative care team. Yes, we we accept all insurances, um, Medicare, um, managed Medicare plans. Um, uh, we have Medi-Cal patients. I mean, yes, we were approved just like any other doctor visit that you would go into the clinic for. We, we build the same way if we're going to home. Um, only our medical providers bill, so the doctors and the nurse practitioners. As a social worker, I do not bill. So, um, you know, I, I can come in and out as, as many times as I need to, uh, which is a benefit, um, I think. Um, and our nurses uh, don't bill. Oh. We're a part of that kind of care. Okay, great. Well, I don't see any more questions, and we've had uh, so many questions already. It's been a wonderful webinar. I want to thank you, Margaret, and we'll thank Dr. Lai, too. And, and uh, I'm sure if you could all see us in a room, we'd be smiling and clapping at you. And <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for your time today. And Denise posted our uh, Palo Alto Parkinson's support group webpage into the chat. And um, the, um, so we post the recordings to that webpage. And we also post all of the speaker slides to that webpage. That's one thing we don't have on YouTube or the speaker slides. So if you go to that webpage and we'll, we'll post Dr. Lai and, and Margaret uh, Stephen's slides there to the web page as well. And um, let's see, and our speaker on July, I think it's Bastille Day. Yes, July 14th, Wednesday, July 14th. That's the second Wednesday of the month at our regular meeting, 2.30. Uh, we're going to have a Parkinson's exercise demo class and it'll be taught by Teresa Najjar. She's a doctor of physical therapy who teaches a wonderful Parkinson's exercise class. So thank you, Margaret, again. And thank you to Dr. Lai, um, who left a little bit. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, thank, and thank, thank you, you so Robin. much. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to for Denise for filling in for our technical issues there at the beginning and apologize for all of those. And it seems like... Uh, uh, all three of us had uh, technical problems, so it worked out great. Uh, somehow at the end, we all got connected and could be heard, and we'll see everybody next time. Have a great weekend, and thank God it's Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye.